Hi everybody, so welcome to the first video on the water and carbon module. Um, fairly obviously from its name, the water and carbon module splits into two halves. Guess what? <laughs> the first half is about the water cycle and the second half is about the carbon cycle. So the first few videos will all be focused on lovely, lovely water. Now, it's not kind of really crucial for you to know the basic properties of water, but equally, if you missed out on this in GCSE science, or you've forgotten it, which is entirely possible, you will find at the beginning of your module booklet three pages, which are the basics of water, um, and I would highly recommend um, that it's probably worth refreshing your knowledge about. Just a few kind of clues. It's H2O, so we've got two hydrogens and an oxygen, um, and they're uh, obviously bonded together. Most of our planet is water, and uh, we have a, most of the world's water in the oceans, and of course the, the world's seas and oceans go up and they go down with sea level change that you've learned about in coasts. Don't panic too much at this map. This is a worst case scenario of, um, of every single bit of ice on planet Earth melting. But you can see it does change the map of uh, the UK and indeed uh, bye bye the Netherlands as well. So it does change things quite dramatically. Water is essential for life on Earth, uh, both animals and plants and of course humans. It has a high specific heat capacity, which means it takes huge amounts of energy to heat up and cool down, which is rather important for fish in ponds and indeed life on Earth. It's uh, distilled water, naturally it's pH 7. Most rainwater is actually about pH 5.5, but uh, distilled water is neutral. This is a very weird picture. This is trying to get across to you that water has a very high surface tension. The molecules <clears throat> like to be together. So it takes, sticky is the wrong word, and particularly if you're a chemist, that is not the right word at all, but it has a high surface tension. So you can see this, uh, I believe that's a leopard, might be a jaguar, uh, swimming. You can see, even though his head is coming out of the water, the, the surface has not yet broken because the water molecules like to be together. It can be a solid, a liquid and a gas, entirely controlled by temperature. And <clears throat> when it's a solid ice, it actually expands. It is less dense in its solid state than in its other states, which is quite weird. Um, and there are a couple of little links there. As ever, I say this a lot of times in these videos, if I teach you, hopefully you've got access to these PowerPoints. If I don't teach you, um, but you're at the college, then you can ask for access, just drop me an email. If you're outside the college, then you're gonna just have to Google them, <laughs> I'm afraid. But they're just a couple of videos about um, how cool water is, how weird it is, that sort of thing. But the start of the module properly is, where is Earth's water? Good news, I am not expecting you to learn all of those percentages at all. If we start over on the left hand side, what we're finding out is that the vast majority of water on Earth, so out of total global water, look, most of it is salty, which is not massively useful to us. Of the 2.5% that's fresh, this is where you would find it, mostly frozen or underground. And then of the 1.2% that's left, this is where you'd find it. It might just be worth having a general sense that most of the water on planet Earth is salty, uh, of the fresh water, water, sorry, most of it is either frozen or underground, that kind of thing. But the other thing that um, you need to know, this year's module booklet is on page seven, that might be slightly different in uh, other years. There is a word that you need to know, which is the word cryosphere. And this comes from the Greek word cryos, which means cold. So ice and snow, any sort of frozen bits of water are collectively known as the cryosphere. That's quite an important word. And um, that YouTube link takes you to a little informative video about the cryosphere. Not crucial for you to watch, but it is quite entertaining. Okay. Here then is the first kind of proper, you definitely need 
to understand this. If you have already studied coasts, you should already know what a system is. But if you haven't already studied coasts, I will just do a quick recap. A system has four things. It has inputs, outputs, stores and processes. So to give you two normal life everyday examples, your body is a system. Um, we don't want to get too disgusting here, but you put food in as an input. It gets digested, which is a process. It gets stored in various places, possibly your fat store, possibly your large intestine for a period of time. Uh, it gets used for all kinds of bodily functions. And then, of course, we have the delightful outputs of urine and faeces. Your body is a system. A car is a system. You put the fuel in. You uh, get exhaust fumes, you get combustion. I am talking obviously pre-electric cars here. Um, you get movement, all of those kinds of things. So systems are really important in physical geography. Inputs, outputs, stores, processes. The other thing you should hopefully know from coasts is that the key idea of a system is if you change one thing, it will have knock-on effects for the rest of that system which has huge significance for managing coasts, but it also has a huge significance for the water cycle. Okay, so you do need a little bit of knowledge and understanding about systems. Now, we are gonna talk about the uh, water cycle at two different scales. This year, this is mentioned on page eight of your module booklet. In other years, it might be slightly different, but there should be a page um, talking about drainage basins and open and closed systems, that kind of thing. At the global scale, the water cycle is what we call a closed system. And what we mean by that, look, none of the water on Earth comes from anywhere else and it doesn't leave. It stays on planet Earth. It is, if you like the phrasing on here, contained within the system boundaries. The only thing that comes out in or out is heat energy, all right? All of the water actually stays here. So that's what we call a closed system. Your body or a car is very definitely an open system because the inputs come from somewhere else and the outputs leave, thank goodness. We generally learn the water cycle at this scale. And this is a really important thing for you to understand. This, ladies and gents, is a drainage basin. It's much less complicated than people think. <laughs> a drainage basin is just an area of land, okay? We are used to places being divided up into countries or counties or parishes. Um, it's that kind of idea, but the, the dividing lines are different. The dividing lines are all to do with where water goes. Now, this is a map of the River X drainage basin. So what they're saying is, any water that falls out of the sky and lands on this area is most likely to land up in the River X. Whereas if you had some precipitation that fell over here, it would go into a different river. And uh, The best I, uh, map I could find to get this across was Australia. They have very kindly mapped all of their drainage basins and colour coded them, which is very helpful. Thank you, Australia. So what these colours are telling you is that the precipitation that falls in this orange area all ends up in one river. The precipitation that um, falls here will end up in a different river. Okay, so they all operate separately, exactly in the same principle as a sediment cell on a coastline. They are operating next to each other, but independently. Okay, and the dividing line between one drainage basin and the next is called a watershed. You may well have heard that word in the context of telly because there is a watershed in the evenings and the rules change in terms of swearing and nudity and violence and those kinds of things. So it's like a dividing line between kind of kid time when kids might be watching telly and adult time. This is a dividing line actually based on water. Okay, so all of the water that falls out the sky and lands this side will go into a different river. All of the water that lands within that line will end up in this river. Now at this scale, the water cycle is open. Okay, 
because that water <clears throat> could have come from the Atlantic Ocean, it could have come from Russia, it could have come from France, so the inputs are coming from somewhere else, and when that river flows out to sea, that water could end up you know, anywhere around the world. And that is the scale that we generally work at. Okay, so at the drainage basin scale, the um, water cycle is what we call open. Uh, so that's that. And then that's just a little introduction to some key words in the water cycle, but we're going to do all of that together. So you only need to open that um, if you'd like to hear somebody else's voice for a minute, which you are very welcome to do. But um, we are going to learn the water cycle now. So the water cycle is represented in loads of different ways. If you do an internet search, you will find so many diagrams and so many um, variations on a theme, okay? Just pick one that works for you. As long as they've got the right kind of words, and I'm gonna teach you what those words are today, I don't mind. Um, you just need to learn these words and how they interact together. So what order do these words go in? Okay, and as long as you can do that, that's fine by me. So I'm just gonna come out of that one. So what I've got here, and I'm gonna go quickly because you can pause um, and take as long as you need to. In your module booklet, you will find a blank table with all of the keywords and what I'm going to now do is define them. I'm not going to read them out to you because you can all read. You would not have got to A level if you couldn't read. Um, and I'm going to go quite quickly and you can pause and copy it out. Okay. So this is the only input to the system. The only input. And you could maybe write that or come up with some colour coding system. But there's only one input and it's the water that falls out the sky. We do need to try and use the word precipitation instead of rain because we do have to accept that water can be frozen and in various kind of situations, which we'll talk about on another video. This is a bit of a weird one and it's not that important, but if you think that there's precipitation falling out the sky, some of it could land straight into the river. It's like a short circuit really, out the sky, into the river, job done. Evaporation. Okay, now your parents may have a saying about, oh my gosh, it was so boring, it was like watching paint dry. Well, <laughs> in a similar kind of situation, that YouTube link is watching water evaporate. So if you're not really sure what evaporation is, then you may well want to watch that. I should just say it is time lapsed, so you're not going to have to sit there for hours watching water evaporate. But if you find that a bit of a like, what? What actually is evaporation? I would open that link and, and have a watch. That is an output, okay? So um, I didn't say, did I? That is a process, sorry. Input, process, output. Right, this is a process and it's something that plants do and it's how they drink effectively. They pull water in through their roots and then it moves up. Uh, in a chain of molecules right to the tip. So that's called transpiration, it's a process. We then take two words, evaporation and transpiration, and we smush them together until into this word, evapotranspiration. And all we need to know is it's an output, but we use a different word because it's water evaporated from plants. This is water evaporated from anywhere else, a puddle, an umbrella, um, your roof, wherever. That is only evaporation from plants. They're both outputs. Okay, if you've ever taken shelter under a tree in a rain shower, you have benefited from something called interception. And what happens is as the rain or the snow or whatever is falling to the earth's surface, it lands on plants instead. And it comes from a sporting term. If you are playing a team sport and you are trying to get the ball off your the opponents, you are trying to intercept the pass, you are trying to get in the way, and that's basically what the plants do. They kind of get in the way of the precipitation uh, coming to earth. Now that is a store, 
this is the one that gets most easily confused. People think it's a process, it isn't, it's a store, okay? So please, please make sure you try to remember that. These are all processes, um, and I'm not gonna say anything about them because they're pretty straightforward. Through full, there's not a lot to say, but if you can imagine, if there was, and there's not actually, <laughs> but if there was a gap between these trees and some of the water fell in that gap, that's what through fall is. So it's pretty pathetic, there's not much to say. Vegetation store is inside the plant. Now we all know that this plant has got water inside it. Uh, this is a thirsty plant, it's wilted. This plant has water inside it. The difference between the interception store and the vegetation store is those leaves that we're looking at in that picture would be wet, there's water on them, and that's the interception store. You can see the interception store, whereas in the vegetation store, the water is inside, you can't see it. Okay, so that's the store. Just, that's the interception and the stuff inside is vegetation. Surface storage, it could be a pond, a lake, a reservoir, a puddle, a paddling pool, really doesn't matter. Um, but that, of course, is a store. The stores generally are pretty obvious because they say that they're stores. So that's nice and easy. Surface runoff, this is a process. It's the most important one because the bit I've put in italics, this is the one that we worry about with regards to flooding. This is water that travels over land. Again, you don't particularly need to open this link, but this is a, a video of this process. <clears throat> If the water has no other choice, it will start moving over the surface of the land and it's very fast and it's the one that has the greatest relationship with flooding. You can call it overland flow, runoff, surface runoff, doesn't matter, but that is a really important one. Infiltration is a process and it's water moving into the soil. What they've done here is they've taken some food colouring and they've... Um, put it into some water and poured the water on the field just so that you can see what infiltration is. Um, it's just water soaking into the soil. This is not in the table, but I would like you to write it somewhere really obvious that you won't forget, please. Impermeable is a word that's worth knowing for the water cycle because impermeable means it will not allow water through it. Humans are very good at building lots of impermeable surfaces, okay, which means no infiltration and lots of surface runoff. It's just an important idea for you and one that we come back to over and over again. That's pretty obvious. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading that to you. Through flow, sideways movement, okay. So if I go back to here, this is vertical, the water goes down. Lateral is that way. The water goes horizontally, if you like, through the soil. That is a process. Percolation is exactly like infiltration, but it's into the rock. So infiltration goes into the soil, percolation is into the rock. But it's entirely the same idea. It's controlled by gravity, the water soaks downwards, it just is into the rock. That's a process. Groundwater store, guess what? Yeah. It is just worth knowing a little bit about the water table, which we will pick up on um, another time. But um, there is a page in your module with some diagrams and information. The water table is very much part of the groundwater store. So they are linked together, okay? Groundwater flow or base flow. I like base flow because it's shorter, there's fewer letters. <laughs> that is um, a flow, it's a process and it's very slow. This could take hundreds or thousands of years to happen, uh, sometimes less, but this is water traveling through the rock. And as it says in italics, if it hasn't been raining for weeks and your rivers are still flowing, which does happen, um, this is where the water is coming from. It's not magic. <laughs> and then the last two are both associated with the river, and that's a bit confusing. If you think about it, the water in a river is going to be there for a few hours or a few days. Therefore, we need to think of it as being a store because the water will stay there for a bit. But eventually that river will flow out to sea and then that water will be lost. 
So channel store is a store, river runoff or channel discharge is an output. And what you should now find is that you have one input, in, which is precipitation, 10 processes, six stores, five of which say store, and the other one is interception, and you should have three outputs, evaporation, evapotranspiration, and the river, river runoff or channel discharge. Okay, so you need to um, do a bit of colour coding and uh, a little bit of, yeah, just making sure that you know that information. All right. One, three, six, ten. Right, that is the end of your first video, ladies and gents. Well done.